things are gonna get crazy. <laughs> Most everyone's mad. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, and also welcome to 2020, everybody. Hope you guys all had a very wonderful holiday. Hope you all celebrated your Christmases, Hanukkahs, Kwanzaas, and also that you've all had a great time with family and friends celebrating the new year. And now that we are early on in 2020, hope you guys have all celebrated settled in and all made sure that you are starting 2020 on the right foot. However, I do completely understand if many of you are a bit on the edge regarding 2020 since in the news we did start off a little bit uh, nervously and uh, maybe a bit bombastic in which some people could take that a bit literally considering the news about Trump taking down the Iran military commander and from there the prospects of World War 3 started to trend all around social media and it really got a lot of people panicking that another major war is about to commence because of Trump's ruthless insanity from there. And I, I do completely understand and empathize with people if this is a time to be worried and scared, considering that we are now at the point that regarding this situation, it is either you support peace or you support Trump. You cannot do both. And if you do support Trump's senseless attack on Iran, then hopefully that would mean that you would go and draft yourself to go into this senseless war. That you would be willing to go and die for your country. Then if you don't, then otherwise you have pretty much proven for many years why people have called Trump supporters deplorable and absolutely worthless. So for now, let us all hope for peace to prevail and hopefully nothing can go even further uh, regarding this um, attack on Iran and hopefully there would be no wars that would be activated or anything that would happen. Otherwise, uh, it's pretty obvious that Trump is just doing that. It, 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 he's just doing this in a desperate attempt to get into uh, to, to stay in the office a little bit longer. But it, it's just proving how he is nothing but a ruthless dictator tyrant in the veins of either Kim Jong-un and yes, even compared to Hitler. That is not a exaggeration in terms of that comparison. But anyways, now with all that said, now with that out of the way, just wanted to bring out my message regarding this bit of news and hopefully um, we will go and uh, pray for the people of Iran and hopefully peace shall prevail. So now with that out of the way, now we can officially start the first episode of 2020 in Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. So with all that said, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to go and ask you all, are you ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it. Are you ready? Let me see now. Yes. Yes. It looks like people are prepared. People are all set. Um, hold on. I need to be a little bit ready. Okay. Yes. I actually am ready. That is perfect. That is great to hear. So now we are all prepared and let's go and get this started and with our first story that i have over here we're going to be looking ahead in the future uh in this 2020 decades considering that uh we did not just enter into a new year but also a brand new decade which is kind of crazy to imagine right now but with that said, what we are going to be discussing about is going to be regarding the future of an animation studio that I'm sure we are all familiar with. And of course, it is one of the most beloved animation studios in the world and especially Japan. 
So I am going to start things off by discussing about the future of Studio Ghibli. Now, there are a few things that we are aware that Studio Ghibli is doing for the future, and it doesn't necessarily be have to it doesn't necessarily have to be about movies in general. It can also be some of their other projects. We know that they have a theme park that's coming to Nagoya, Japan in 2022, and I don't necessarily mean a theme park like Disneyland. I mean more like a literal themed park where it is just a park that is Studio Ghibli themed. Uh, and then there is also something that was actually revealed not too long ago, which is a kabuki play based on Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. But in terms of their movies, they actually got not one, but two feature films coming soon. Yes, in an annual letter sent out by Studio Ghibli, they have revealed that there is not one, but two animated features that they are working on for the future. Now, there is one that we do know that's going to be coming in uh, the, the near future, like in a few years or so. Uh, one that will be directed by the legendary Hayao Miyazaki, in which he has a book, uh, well, not a book, well, he's going to adapt a book called How Do You Live? by uh, Genzaburo Yoshino. And he has been working on that for a few years now, and originally, it was stated that it was scheduled to be released for this year. That it would have been released around the same time as the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. But that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case, and it will most likely be released sometime uh, maybe next year or 2022 or even 2023, considering that recent reports have stated that uh, so far they have only been, uh, they are only at 15% uh, of the entire completion of the movie. They only got 15% of it. They still got 85% to go on this thing. And they've already worked on it for like, what, two or three years now? So there's still a long way to go for Miyazaki's movie. But then, there is also the other film. Now, they didn't necessarily go into specifics. We don't know what it is. But this article here, coming from Animation Magazine, seemed to be giving us a little bit of a clue of what it could possibly be. We don't know if it's going to be uh, that in particular, but they did hint out of a possible clue that has been revealed back in 2017 of a future project. Uh, as it states here, no additional information on the second film project was included in the announcement, but the studio could be referring to the CG animated film being directed by Miyazaki's son, Goro Miyazaki. And Goro has already gotten experience in terms of directing a few movies down at Studio Ghibli, considering that he was the director of Tales from Earthsea and uh, from Up on Poppy Hill. But with that said, uh, let us go and read this actual announcement coming from Studio Ghibli, uh, which it was mostly to say Happy New Year and just, uh, uh, you know, hope for the best for 2020 and all that kind of stuff. But I'll, I'll go and read it to you. So <clears throat> here it goes. Happy New Year to all. Thank you for always supporting Studio Ghibli. Last year was not a bad year for Studio Ghibli because it was possible to share the news of our Kabuki stage production and other works, the official announcement of Ghibli Park and active overseas development. However, disasters such as typhoons and heavy rains in Japan are continuing and it is painful to think that there are a lot of people who are forced to have a hard life even at this time. We would like to express our sincere condolences to those affected by the damage and pray for the rebuilding of our lives as soon as possible. By the way, the zodiac sign of 2020 is rat. Rats are symbolic of prosperity because of their prolific reproduction and are also said to be the angels of the god of fertility. I hope that the stagnant mood of society will be renewed and that we will have a year of hope. Studio Ghibli continues to work on two new films. That's where the big announcement came from. Also, Ghibli Park has started in earnest, so we hope to be able to deliver a lot for a lot of excitement this year. So, 
this is basically the whole thing that's going on. Uh, basically, the highlight of all this is to get a little update on what's going on at Studio Ghibli, and even though they have been quiet recently, we know that they are still very hard at work uh, producing a lot of major projects. And especially when it comes to North America, we do know that Studio Ghibli has been a name that we haven't heard in a long time, especially with the fact that the last movie that they have released was uh, back in 2015, I believe, with When Marnie Was There, and then after that, we've heard pretty much nothing, especially with uh, a few other people moving uh, towards different places. I mean, technically, yes, we did have, like, recent news, like, with the passing of Aiseo Takahata, and then um, we got Hiromasa Yonebayashi moving on to another studio, or b I, I believe building his own studio uh, with Studio Panak, which they would go and uh, produce Studio Ghibli-style feature films, which uh, one of them they have released and many people might be familiar with is with Mary and the Witch's Flower. But down at Studio Ghibli, even though uh, in terms of North American news, it has been very minimal and they have been very quiet, uh, they are still hard at work with tons of other stuff. I'm sure we are all familiar with Ghibli Park and what they want to do with that. Uh, that is still heavy in production right now. So um, even though it's not going to be released anytime soon, the release date is stated to be sometime in 2022. So uh, of course, they're, uh, they're going to go and work on that for now uh but then also there have been a few things that they have worked on on the side but not necessarily be a prominent studio ghibli film like we know that with hayao miyazaki even after he stated that he would retire after the wind rises right afterwards uh he went and uh directed this uh cg animated short meant to be exclusive for ghibli park called boro the caterpillar so there was that going on, and then there was also Studio Ghibli working on the side, like just helping out another animated feature called The Red Turtle. Um, it's not necessarily a full-on Studio Ghibli film, but they did assist, and I believe it was Aiseo Takahata that also lent out a helping hand before he passed away. And if you guys have not seen The Red Turtle, please do so. It is an absolutely beautiful film that is totally worth watching and then on top of that of course we've already heard a lot about the news about Hayao Miyazaki wanting to do another film with How Do You Live in fact there was even a documentary that was actually released chronicling how Miyazaki has been doing recently with working on projects like Boro the Caterpillar and starting on How Do You Live uh, the, uh, the documentary that is called The Neverending Man. Uh, I have yet to see it myself, to be honest, or at least by the time I'm recording this, I have yet to see it myself, but I do have the Blu-ray. I know that I have it on hand. I know I got it ready, so I can go and start off on that, maybe. <laughs> Sometime soon, I better, I better go check that out, especially if the news about Studio Ghibli starts really get, getting going, and, like, we would see some of their projects come to life. But, Overall, with this little bit of news over here, it, it is actually very nice to hear that they are still working very hard. And uh, especially the fact that there is not just one movie that's coming, but also two of them. And maybe it may not necessarily be uh, what uh, Animation Magazine is stating. Like, maybe it's actually not the CG animated film from Goro Miyazaki. Maybe it, it could actually be someone else that uh, they found a new prodigy, like a, a new director that they would go and uh, try out so that they can continue the legacy of Studio Ghibli even long after Hayao Miyazaki. So there could be that going on. Like we could be seeing a phase at Studio Ghibli that they're starting to pass the baton and they better do so soon because like we already lost Aiseo Takahata and then we got Hayao Miyazaki, which he's very close to his 80s. If not, he's already 80 years old. And I mean, as much as we would joke around the fact that, oh, he's always retiring, but he's always coming back to do another animated film, the dude is already getting pretty old and, like, he's not that far from death's door. So hopefully soon, Studio Ghibli will find new successors to go and develop more Studio Ghibli films that will continue the legacy of what Takahata and Miyazaki already established. And hopefully that could be the case with uh, this feature film. 
maybe it will be with Goro Miyazaki and that he's continuing to train himself to improve his craft to make better and better films. Because let's be honest, with Goro Miyazaki, he did start off a bit on the wrong foot with Tales of Earthsea, which it's not a bad movie, but many people do refer to uh, do refer Tales of Earthsea as the weakest of the Studio Ghibli films. But then, like, he started to pick himself up. Like, it did get a bit better with uh, From Up on Poppy Hill. So hopefully, like, we would see a bit of an elevation from Goro Miyazaki that maybe one day he could get up into the same leagues as his dad. So maybe it could be with that. I, I, I don't know. But we do know that there is more than one movie that will be coming up. And that, I will admit, I am actually pretty excited. It's just now the big question is regarding... With uh, Miyazaki's movie, How Do You Live? When is that going to be coming out? Because as I've said, uh, as I've uh, stated before, originally it was supposed to be for the Summer Olympics. It was supposed to be for this year. We're in 2020 and this year we are supposed to have the Tokyo Olympics. But it doesn't look like we're also going to have How Do You Live? And I mean, technically, in the history of Studio Ghibli, this is not necessarily, uh, this is not their first time that they have to eventually delay their movies uh, because, like, production has been going pretty slow. Like, uh, some great examples, I think The L the Wind Rises faces a bit of, uh, f it, like, it, it did face a little bit of delay, maybe not, but I know definitely The Tale of Princess Kaguya did so. Like, it was real, it was definitely one of those films where uh, the director's perfectionism, in this case, Iseo Takahata, really was the biggest obstacle of the movie. But finally, they did manage to break it and they did finally manage to release the feature. Uh, so maybe that could also be the case because, uh, like, it is a little bit ridiculous when you do think about it that over the three years, ever since 2017, when the project was announced, so far, we only got 15% of it finished. Does that include the uh, storyboards? Or does that include, like, with the animation or stuff like that? I, I don't know. But it, it does seem a bit ridiculous. And hopefully, we could get it soon. Or at the very least, get it before Miyazaki is gone. Uh, like, hopefully, we could have it be, you know, hopefully Miyazaki can see that thing be complete like you know it would be a bit tragic if he did pass away before the release of how do you live and then we would get another case of the jungle book where uh the legendary name that would be attached to it has unfortunately passed away before the project would be finished so i don't know i am hoping for the fact i am hoping that how do you live would be released soon so that we would get another miyazaki movie while Miyazaki is still with us. But overall, with this little le with this little letter, and by the way, here's an image uh, that they did associate with, uh, with with the little letter that they have. It's uh, it's 2020 and it's uh, a little drawing of a bunch of rats where one rat is like walking away with a sack of coins uh, where the coins are kind of like ri like ripping the bag and it's like starting to fall on the floor and then we see like a whole bunch of rats. So that's a, a pretty cute right there. But overall, this is actually a nice reminder that uh, like even though we haven't heard much from Studio Ghibli, we know for a fact that Studio Ghibli is alive and well and they got plenty of big things that are going to be coming in the future, especially for Japan. Rather it be with a Kabuki stage production of Nausicaa, rather it be for Ghibli Park, or with a couple of their movies. Overall, I think... Um, at least for this podcast, it is a great way to start 2020 by giving us a reminder of how one of our favorite animation studios is going. So, with that said, now that I got that done, it is now time that I would like to go into the chat wall. And I would like to ask you guys, uh, what do you think about this little update about... Um, what's happening at Studio Ghibli with the two movies and their other projects. Let me all know, uh, let me know what you think. I don't know if it's either a burp or a hiccup that's, like, coming my way, but... Okay. Just need to get that a little bit out of my system. Uh, anyways, let's go and, uh, read some, uh, chat, uh, let's see, read some comments here. Let's see. 
Boy, did I miss this studio. Uh, I had so many fond memories of their movies. I was worried that something bad had happened uh, to the company after when Marnie was there. I mean, uh, four to five years hiatus? Come on now. Well, it's good to hear that the company is doing just fine. I wonder when Miyazaki is going to retire soon from animation. Probably never. Oh, he ain't. He's going to keep on animating until he dies. I, I can pretty much uh, clarify on that. He, he's going to be exactly like Richard Williams. He like The only way he's going to die is going to be at his desk with a pencil, like, face on his drawing. Like, I think that's going to be the way that he's going to go. Like, he's going to die working on an animated project. Rather it be with How Do You Live or another project, like a short or another film that he was planning. So, I, I just want to go and uh, clarify on that, but... I, I, I think the reason why a lot of people are kind of uh, worried with Studio Ghibli or concerned of, of the fact that they haven't heard from them is not necessarily the company's fault itself. It's mainly because we do live in an environment with animated films where studios would be pumping them out uh, like almost in a mass produced way because now it is extremely common for animated studio for animation studios to release one animated film per year and that can often be like the minimum sometimes we would see studios release two to three animated features annually it's honestly a bit ridiculous because there was a time like there was a once upon a time when it's actually common how Studio Ghibli is right now, where we would have like four to five years hiatus. Like look at um lo look at Disney in the past, like in the days of Walt Disney. Like I'm thinking a of one example. Like I imagine like with The Lady and the Tramp, that movie was released in 1955. Their next movie, Sleeping Beauty, would not be released until four years later. So there is still that major gap that we have seen. And the same can also be said with, um, like, The Sword in the Stone, released in 1963, and then four years later, it's their next movie with uh, The Jungle Book. So it's not necessarily Studio Ghibli's fault why we are worried that nothing is coming out of them. It's mainly because we do live in an environment where the animated films have been mass-produced nowadays. All right, anyways, uh, I've really went on with that comment, so uh, let's jump on to the next one. I read that Hayao Miyazaki started to work on Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland, but left the project and consider it the worst his worst experience. If you haven't seen the film, I highly recommend it. Okay, uh, let's see. It's nice to see Studio Ghibli back in the animation game and even experimenting with new styles. I am a bit curious of Goro's project considering how Earthsea turned out, but it's always good to see Hayao Miyazaki back in the director's seat and out of retirement again. Uh, I don't think it'll top films like Totoro and obviously not Spirited Away, but I'm excited to see what comes out of the studio. Yeah, definitely. Uh, honestly, it is a good thing for one of the best animation studios in Japan doing a lot of work uh, to start fresh in the new year. And then there's one that's like, long live Hayao Miyazaki. <laughs> All right, um, well, let's see another comment. Uh, it's a bit ironic that you're talking about Miyazaki since the indie theater I volunteered was showing Totoro today, but I literally got back uh, to the country a couple of hours ago, and even though I wanted, uh, I wanted to go, at least uh, they showed Kiki next month. Uh, other than that, let Ghibli take their time. I would prefer quality over quantity. Fingers crossed uh, that these movies get a wider release than a Fathom Events in North America. Uh, I don't know, to be honest, because we are at the point, at least with the North American releases, uh, they are under G Kids, and usually that's the best that they could do, is just Fathom event stuff. Uh, like, back in the day, there was a time when Studio Ghibli films would actually get wide releases, but that was back when they were associated with Disney. That's why we did get movies, uh, such as Ponyo, The Secret World of Arietti, and The Wind Rises getting a full-on legitimate wide release in theaters instead of just, uh, the little limited ones, uh, that indie films would get. So, honestly, to be realistic, I highly doubt that it, this one would get a wide release, unless there would be a studio that decided to really step up and try to make How Do You Live, like, very prominent. Uh, that is something that we'll have to wait and see, but I feel like in the position that Studio Ghibli is right now and with their deals with North American distributors, 
I don't know if there would legitimately be a wide release in that sense. All right, let's see now. I'm excited to see that Studio Ghibli is still doing fine so far and starting to make new animated films in the 2020 decade. I hope these two upcoming films get made and released under uh, Hayao Miyazaki or things might get fall fallen apart. I'm excited that they are still around and I hope uh, to manage to get it made just in time. All right, that's very nice. I'll go and read uh, one more comment before we're going to start on to the uh, next one. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's weird. The Ghibli movies were originally released by Disney in America, but now they're on Warner Brothers streaming service. Ah, yeah. Oh, and that's actually another thing that I almost forgot to mention about the updates with Studio Ghibli films is that another big thing that's going to be going on is that uh, all the Studio Ghibli films are going to be airing on HBO Max. So if you want a streaming service with all the Studio Ghibli films, then um, HBO Max is pretty much for you. But uh, overall, it is nice to get this little update from Studio Ghibli, and I wish them the best of luck in the 2020 decade. Okay, now with that said, it is now time that we are going to go and jump onto our next story. Now, I have talked enough about what's going to be happening in the future, but now let's go and discuss a little bit about some things in the past. Or actually, uh, even though technically I would say these are events that happened last year, uh, in truth, these are things that happened only about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but one of, th one of the things that I would like to discuss is regarding... Star Wars. Yes, this will be a bonus miscellaneous, and I will be discussing about the new movie, The Rise of Skywalker. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to be talking about some major spoilers. I'm not going to go into that territory. There will be some minor spoilers into what I will discuss, but there won't be anything that will be major in this instance. But, uh, the reason why I would like to discuss about The Rise of Skywalker is that so far, uh, things have not been going well for that movie in particular. Uh, the only good that has pretty much come out of that is that so far, we are starting to see Star Wars fans starting to come together, starting to unite, where beforehand, people were so divided over The Last Jedi, where people either really, really love it or really, really hate it, but now both the lovers and haters are starting to work together, starting to bond a bit, because of how underwhelming uh, the, the Rise of Skywalker is. And a big reason for that is, is mainly because there have been many fans and many people uh, in the Star Wars community have accused the Rise of Skywalker for pretty much boycotting The Last Jedi, retconning all the ideas that have been introduced in The Last Jedi in order to go and pursue their own ideas. And that inevitably just broke into pieces it ended up some people would say completely ruined the rise of skywalker but some people though would say otherwise and in this instance it would be one of the writers of the rise of skywalker chris terrio where in this uh article here from the hollywood reporter uh chris terrio would go and discuss a lot about the rise of Skywalker. He would discuss not only the elements uh, related to The Last Jedi, but also a lot of creative choices that uh, ended up in... Ooh, excuse me. Uh, that ended up in the film and pretty much highlights how this is the conclusion of not just the trilogy, but also of the entire Skywalker saga. So uh, in this article, they would discuss a lot about many of the creative choices that he and J.J. Abrams would do. But in this instance, considering that I promise I'm not going into major spoilers, I would only discuss about the elements that are related to The Last Jedi. Now, one of the things that a lot of people have accused The Rise of Skywalker is there is this one line that pretty much a lot of people interpret it as a jab to The Rise of Skywalker. It was when Luke came in and he stated, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, here it is. Um, when Luke came in in Rise of Skywalker and said, 
a Jedi's weapon deserves more respect. And a lot of people kind of interpret that as a bit of a metaphor and a little bit of a jab of the opening from The Last Jedi. And if you guys don't know what happened, um, Rey was about to give Luke Skywalker uh, his lightsaber and he picked it up and pretty much just chucked it out to the sea. Like he just threw it away. Well, okay, maybe not out to the sea. He just like, meh, screw this thing. Uh, he, he just threw it out. So a lot of people interpret that as maybe it was a bit of a jab to that. But Terrio, though, would say the opposite. He said that this is not necessarily true. Uh, he stated here, those people who see it as a meta argument between JJ and Ryan are missing the point, I think. Uh, at the end of The Last Jedi, Luke has changed. I think it would have been bad misreading to think that that was somehow me and JJ having an argument with Ryan. Uh, it was more like we were in dialogue with Ryan by using what Luke did at the beginning of The Last Jedi to now say that history will not repeat itself and all these characters have grown. But if there is one example that is the most prominent above all else regarding how the Rise of Skywalker is pretty much trying to abandon the ideas of The Last Jedi, then it has to be with Rose Tico, uh, who is played by Kelly Marie Tran. And in The Rise of Skywalker, her role has been significantly reduced. In fact, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but Rose Tico only appeared for not even two minutes throughout the entire feature. Like if you count, if you took all of her screen times, then you would result, you would end up with something that's just a little over a minute, or at least less than two minutes. And a lot of people are outraged because of the minimal use of Rose Tico, mainly because of how Kelly Marie Tran was treated. Where after the release of the Last Jedi, you may remember how Kelly Marie Tran has been abused and harassed on Twitter uh, mainly by people who are just racist and sexist and just flat out mean to her to the point that she had to abandon the uh, social media that it really was one of the darkest moments of the Star Wars community uh, of the Star Wars community's uh, history where they were like they they got their entitlement and outrage get the best of them to the point of attacking one of the actors just for basically doing their jobs. And basically, after that treatment, they think that it's completely unfair and unjustified the fact that they would reduce her role to almost nothing. Like, it, it, could, basically, it, it could basically be considered a cameo at that point. And from there, uh, Chris Terrio, again, has a bit of a response to that by saying... Uh, there, were, there were a couple of scenes uh, that we shot with Rose that I wish had made it into the final cut. But it's the nature of the process that certain scenes fall out of the film. And I very much respect the difficulty of the decision J.J. had to make. Especially given that I know for a fact that J.J. adores and respects Kelly. And would have loved to keep every second he shot with her in the film. So that's basically the main summary of this. The rest, uh, like I said, it's mainly going into major spoiler territory onto the creative decisions of The Rise of Skywalker and the way that they concluded this entire saga. Now, when I did go and read this entire article, there is a part of me that did feel that maybe it is true that Chris Terrio is trying to be genuine. That th maybe this is his entire opinion on this whole thing. And maybe he genuinely does feel uh, that he does have, like maybe he does have a lot of respect for Ryan Johnson and for The Last Jedi as well. However, with that said, it is also impossible to read this and not think that this is Disney manufactured damage control. That right now, they are trying to put so much love onto The Last Jedi in order to make things up for the backlash against The Rise of Skywalker. And it, like, honestly, when you do read this, it really does show. And even when I tried to, um, 
read some of this to you, like even with some of the excerpts that I have read, it really shows that they have been overpraising the elements of the rise of Skywalker. Now, I'm not saying that it is like this is something that you guys should either absolutely love or absolutely hate. Whatever opinion you may have on the last on the last Jedi, that's perfectly fine. Whatever, it's just a movie. But there are things in this article here with Chris Terrio is saying that you could feel that they're trying to put so much love into the elements of The Last Jedi, uh, mainly because of the whole damage control situation. Where, like, even when talking about uh, Kelly Marie Tran, that he says, like, oh, JJ adores and respects Kelly and would have loved to keep every second he shot with her in the film. Well, why didn't you do so, man? I mean, I know that technically J.J. Uh, Abrams is just the director and that, well, just the director and has involved himself in a few other things. And there are a few people that are way higher up than him. Like, of course, like there are more, there are people who would have more of a say onto the film, like either Kathleen Kennedy or Bob Iger and stuff like that. But um, like still though, he, J.J. Abrams still had power, and if he truly did believe in Kelly Marie Tran and really wanted to use her a lot, then he would have at least put some effort to at least fight for Kelly Marie Tran to have her be in a more prominent role. And especially with the fact that, uh, here's another one, this is another minor spoiler, but you may remember in The Last Jedi that they did establish a little bit of a romance between, um, uh, Rose and Finn where they actually did kiss but then afterwards that's pretty much rejected and Finn like throughout the movie he's just going back like seemingly have a crush on Rey maybe and then like there's another character like a new character that appeared that immediately they had a, a, a bit of a click over there so honestly it's like yeah, you could say that, oh, we love Kelly Marie Tran and stuff like that, but honestly, I can't help but feel doubtful. Like, I am pressing X to doubt on that. Because, like, I, because the thing is, actions speak louder than words. You could say that, but that's not necessarily what I am seeing in the final film itself. Yeah, you could say that you love and adore Kelly Marie Tran, but not enough to, like, to have her appear, to have her appear a whole lot in the movie. And also, there's actually something really funny in this article in particular that does kind of expose how this pretty much is just Disney manufactured damage control. And it's actually one of the questions uh, right at the bottom where not even uh, the character, not even Chris Terrio himself was able to answer. Like, re like listen to this. It it's honestly kind of hilarious. Uh, it, it says here, during The Last Jedi press, Daisy Ridley said that the answer to Rey's parentage hasn't changed since J.J. first took her on the set of The Force Awakens. Instead of the narrative that J.J. retconned Ryan's answer of nobody, is it more, accu is it more accurate to say that J.J. retconned his own original answer, at least from your vantage point? And Chris Terrio's answer is... I don't think I could speak for a for JJ on this, or uh, even to give my vantage point on his vantage point. I'll have to leave it to JJ. Is this not the most obvious example of throwing someone else under the bus? I know that technically this is more of a JJ Abrams type of question, but still, I can't help but feel like this guy. He can't think of a legit answer, so he's just trying to throw JJ under the bus. It's like. Ask JJ, not me. <laughs> Don't get me too involved in this. And it's so obvious that it really is nothing but damage control. And I, and, and honestly, uh, in my opinion, I really do feel like, yes, like as someone who has seen both, well, pretty much has seen uh, the entire trilogy at this point, I, I can definitely say that I can see that, yes, I do believe that Disney was trying to, to retcon um, The Last Jedi a bit for The Rise of Skywalker in order to please that group of fans, the ones that passionately hate The Last Jedi to the point that 
it is like an obsessive and unhealthy hatred. It's honestly a little bit ridiculous. And Disney was trying to please those fans in particular, but it failed miserably. They failed to play, you know, they, they, they pretty much, uh, pass on to the rest of the people like they failed to please any of the other people and they didn't please the people that they wanted to please e either which pretty much leaves everybody disappointed and that is why disney right now they are trying to save themselves and trying to get back into loving the last jedi all over again and, and you can even tell like even before the rise of skywalker's release you would often see a lot of press releases and a lot of articles talking about how some of the cast and crew were throwing shade a little bit on both the last jedi and on um on ryan johnson where a lot of people were trying, like maybe they didn't say it directly, but you could tell that they were trying to throw shade that they did not approve of like the decisions that were done in The Last Jedi. And this would be coming from people like uh, John Boyega with J.J. Abrams and even a little bit of Mark Hamill. I know Mark Hamill does have a history of uh, uh, of having a love-hate relationship with uh, The Rise of, uh, not Rise of Skywalker, but uh, having a love-hate relationship with The Last Jedi, but they did try to bring that back a bit. Like, they did try to establish a bit of a hatred for The Last Jedi, saying that even the cast and crew is on the side of The Last Jedi haters and stuff like that, but it failed miserably. And on top of that, like, another thing that kind of ruined it for them is actually because of the movie Knives Out. Because now we are at the point that the new movie Knives Out, it was highly praised. And of course, it was directed by Ryan Johnson, which led people to love that film and to have a massive amount of love on Ryan Johnson right now, where it pretty much embarrassed Disney and embarrassed the rise of Skywalker. And that is currently what Disney is doing. And it's not only critically that it, they, they're paying for it. You know, it's not just in terms of the critics and the audiences. It's not just the reactions. But it's also noticeable in terms of the box office result. Hold on, I'm going to refresh this just to give a, a, a clear answer of what we see. Because if you look at the box office, like if you look at how much it's making at the box office right now. You can definitely tell that it's even hitting them financially. Where, as I'm recording this, right now, uh, The Rise of Skywalker has a domestic total of $428 million and a worldwide total of $851 million. Now, I am not saying that this is a flop. I'm not saying that The Rise of Skywalker is a disaster and that they're losing money. Like, it is well on its way to make over a billion dollars, and Disney is definitely going to make their money out of it. Like, that is not what I'm saying at all. But the thing is, you got to keep in mind that this movie is supposed to be a really, really big deal. Like, we're not just talking about the final film in the recent trilogy, but I am talking about this is the final film in the entire Skywalker saga. Episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 all lead to this one epic moment. This is supposed to be the grand finale of all the Star Wars films, or at least the ones with the characters we all know and love that we have grown up with for so long, with Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Chewbacca, C-3PO, Darth Vader, and all those guys. This is supposed to be the grand finale. Technically, this is the kind of film that's supposed to be in the same leagues as Endgame, where if it played all of its cards right, and it ended up being highly critically praised and beloved by audiences, then it would have legitimately made as much money as Endgame. Like, it would have really went up there. Or if not Endgame, then at least surpass $2 billion. Like, at this point, it should have already made over a billion dollars before Christmas. But that has not happened yet. And I have seen reports that people are stating that there is a strong possibility that The Rise of Skywalker is not going to make as much as The Last Jedi, where it might end up with maybe like $1.2 billion and that's it. Where even move, where like even Frozen 2, 
has already reached a point where that made a lot more money than The Rise of Skywalker ever will. So what I'm basically saying is, and, and this also reflects on my opinion on the movie itself as well, is that the thing is, with The Rise of Skywalker, it is not a disaster. It is not a big mistake. It is not something that's going to really hurt Disney so much. Overall, The Rise of Skywalker, the if there is one word to best describe it, is that it's underwhelming. The movie itself, like, for, in my opinion, the movie itself, it's not the worst movie uh, of the year. I wouldn't even say it's the worst movie that's currently in theaters. Uh, it's definitely, like, honestly, I would take this over a bunch of movies. I, I think The Rise of Skywalker is even better than uh, Spies in Disguise, honestly. Like, it does have a lot of great action despite the weak writing. So, uh, but overall, I would say with The Rise of Skywalker, for the kind of movie that it established itself, for the years of build-up that it was trying to make, it really is underwhelming. The movie itself is underwhelming. People's reaction to it is commonly underwhelming. And the box office result is underwhelming. That Disney tried to please... It really is a situation where Disney tried desperately hard to please everyone, but it ultimately led to pleasing no one. And honestly, it's kind of ironic because, in a way, uh, Star Wars fans are a little bit more united than they used to with uh, The Last Jedi, but it's in a way that ultimately ended up screwing the franchise and uh, a little bit screwing up Disney as well. So... Honestly, th that, that's basically all that I really wanted to talk about in this instance. Oh, and by the way, there is one more thing that I would like to mention, just to get that out of the way, is that we, we are at the point also that, that, like, maybe this is not necessarily related to this, but honestly, it's at a point where it's just, like, it's so ridiculous that, oh my god, I can't believe this is legitimately happening again, is that I saw on social media that there was one thing that was trending, and it, it couldn't have turned me off even more, is that apparently people are trying to make a campaign of release the Abrams cut, that apparently this is all Disney's fault, and that J.J. Abrams' vision is not brought to, is not brought completely to life in, uh, the, in The Rise of Skywalker, and we were supposed to have ghosts of characters like, uh, d uh of Anakin, Ewan McGregor, and Samuel Jackson, and all those, and Hay Hayden Christensen, and all those, and I was like, oh, God, would you please shut up? Oh, God. No, by the way, no. I do not believe in the, like, honestly, I don't believe that there is an Abrams cut. Like, honestly, that's the point where, like, there's a fine line right over here where I gotta say, okay, that's it. Let's stop all this. This is, it's just a freaking movie, guys. There's no such thing as an Abrams cut. Don't be complaining about something that you're never going to get that Disney isn't going to do anyways. Just move on and grow up. Holy crap. It's just, I'm sorry. Like, I saw, like, I, I, I just feel like it's so ridiculous. It's like, yeah, we're, like, you want to pull a freaking release the Snyder Cut thing, but onto Star Wars. It's like, no, let's, like, can we please... Don't, let's not make release the person's cut a thing, please, okay? I, I don't, I do not want this at all. Don't, don't even, man. I just, don't, no, no Abrams cut, like, I cannot even with releasing whoever's cut it is, all right? I don't even want to know. And by the way, some people are saying that, um, so you're saying we should blame the fans, in terms of what happened with the movies, like, especially with The Rise of Skywalker, yes, absolutely. There is no one else that we could blame for this than the reactions towards the fans. Uh, their entitlement and, uh, their, and their emotions really got the best of them, where they, they just really acted insane online and have done things that are very unnecessary and just downright cruel, especially uh, towards, uh, like, one example is, um, how people treated Kelly Marie Tran, which, no, it shouldn't have happened. 
And, and honestly, that was one of my complaints as well. Like, I, even for me as well, I do feel like they really underused uh, Kelly Marie Tran. She did not deserve uh, to be treated that way. And she did not deserve to be treated like how she did uh, with the final result of The Rise of Skywalker. She's a very talented actress, and she did very well. Like, she's one of the better things of The Last Jedi. And honestly, they should have used her character a lot more. So I just want to say, yes, it's that, like... If there's anyone to blame with what happened with the Rise of Skywalker, it is not Kathleen Kennedy's fault. I wouldn't even say it's J.J. Abrams' fault. It is 100% the fans' fault. <laughs> Alright, so with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall and let's go and talk to you guys about, um, why, like, how do you feel about what happened with the rise of skywalker uh do you feel like do you believe in chris terrio that they tried to honor the last jedi or do you feel like they completely retconned the last jedi let me know what you guys think oh this is interesting and also yeah actually that's another thing i want to say um uh like if you have an opinion on the rise of skywalker please like share it man like let me know what you think of it okay uh, as one of the rare people who love The Rise of Skywalker, I'd say the biggest problem of the movie is, aside from the convoluted plot, is the treatment of its predecessor. I really don't think it should have uh, pandered to the fans to the point where Rose only got 76 seconds of screen time and Terrio's comments don't really help. Also, minor spoilers here, but I also don't like how they left the... Oh, how they left the screen explaining Palpatine's survival out of the film. That's like the most important aspect of the plot. You know, honestly, from what I've been hearing is that apparently they did explain a little bit, but only for like, only on Fortnite for some reason. Like, they, it's like, yeah, they did explain it, but you gotta go through all the flossing and like, Okay, so how, uh, like, you, you gotta go through, like, the stupid dances, like that. Boom, ba -na 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 -na. Here's why Palpatine's back now. <laughs> -na 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 -na. You know, you gotta do that kind of bullcrap. I don't know. Like, maybe I'm wrong on that, but. <coughs> <coughs> oh, fudge. I am going to die. Anyways, um, uh, like, they did explain it, but it's just not in the freaking movie for some reason. Anyways, uh, let's get back to this. Uh, the Star Wars fandom is becoming like the Sonic fandom. Most of their classic fans are never satisfied with the modern results, even when they try to bring the spirits of the original. Say what you will about the prequels, at least George Lucas was just doing his own thing with them. Disney and JJ are trying too hard to please fans. When you're making a movie, don't think too much about what fans want. Think about what you want for viewers to see. Your vision to your movie is more important and actually there is one quote that i would like to say that really does summarize perfectly about the rise of skywalker and that and this is actually something from ryan johnson not far from the release of the rise of skywalker is that it is much more important to challenge fans than it is to please fans and that you know and honestly like i remember when that when like that news came out when Ryan Johnson first said that. I was a little bit confused. But then I saw The Rise of Skywalker and I was like, ah, uh, now I get what he's trying to say. All right, I'll go and read a few more. Uh, I thought Last Jedi was, was a great film. My only criticism with the film is that it can be a bit too long at points. Plus, people should not listen to The Last Jedi haters since uh, their opinions are straight up lies and they constantly harass the crew for the movie. That, that, that's the commenter who said that, not me. So j j just letting, letting that out there. So like, I, I know that's the kind of comment where like someone would be in trouble if they say that. So I just want to clarify. It ain't me. <laughs> I'm going to do, it's JJ Abrams. He's the one who said it. <laughs> going to do like Chris Terrio to JJ. Just throw people under the bus. <laughs> okay. Anyways. um, uh, Let's see. Actually, J.J. has stated that the reason Kelly Marie Tran wasn't in the movie was because of Carrie Fisher, which, of course, is complete BS. Wait, what? <laughs> is because... Okay, like, I understand that the, the production was, like, a little bit... Okay, not a little bit, but very messy, and that they had to work around uh, working with whatever clips they can use with uh, Carrie Fisher, but... 
Nah, not really. I mean, like, there are ways you could go around that. Like, even, like, even with or without Carrie Fisher, you could have freaking Rose tag along with Paul, Finn, and Ray. Why not do that? You know, she could be a useful asset to the crew. Uh, anyways, um... Uh, who knew what Ryan Johnson was right when he said, Pleasing the fans is wrong. Uh, I think, yeah, okay, yeah, and that's the quote that I'm talking about. I think approaching any creative process with making fandoms happy would be a mistake that would lead to probably the exact opposite result. The Rise of Skywalker! That's exactly what he is talking about, folks! Alright, I'll read one more comment before we go and uh, jump on to the next one. Uh, let's see here. Personally, I just don't care what people are saying about the film. Uh, the film ended the year with a major bang. The actors were amazing. Rose at least had a role as a resistance leader. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and good screen time. And C-3PO was the main character, sort of. Okay, he was my main reason I wanted to see the movie, and he was hilarious in this. Sure, it's not as quite as great as the previous films. Like, I do question if Leia was supposed to do that role for the previous film with now just the obvious, but still was an epic film. All right. You know, I honestly, like, I I'm glad that we did have a, a little moment to have a great discussion about uh, The Last Jedi, or just Star Wars in general. I, I can understand there are certain areas that it can be toxic, but I'm actually very proud of you all, uh, especially proud of the chat wall that... Um, that we can have like a nice civil conversation without going like uh, like going all haywall because we all have to remember even though like they are legendary franchises they are just movies after all okay so for our next story i would just like to make one more little clarification Regarding the rise of Skywalker, now I have already stated that everything about it is just underwhelming. Not the worst movie of the year, not the worst, you know, it's not even the worst Star Wars film, but it is pretty underwhelming. And everything about it and all the results of it is just underwhelming. But one thing that I can say, and this is something that the chat wall has already stated plenty of times, at the very least... No matter what happens to The Rise of Skywalker, at least it's going way better than freaking cats. And this is actually kind of a two-part story that I have for you here regarding what has happened with the 2019 musical of Cats. And I'll start things off with uh, our first story which is going to be an article from Variety, and this is already something that was mentioned last week. In fact, this happened just after Christmas, that Universal officially removed Cats from its For Your Consideration page. Now, for those of you who don't know, the For Your Consideration page is actually a list of movies that studios would have in order to make a huge campaign out of them to have their movies be nominated for several awards. And it doesn't matter which ones, uh, just to have those movies collect as many awards as possible. Uh, rather it be like the ones from newspapers like the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times or whatever, uh, the Oscars, the Annies, the Golden Globes, the BAFTAs, and all that kind of stuff. And this year, Universal does have uh, certain movies that they are pushing to campaign to make them have be to, to make them have as much nominations as possible. Uh, in fact, on this little list here, Universal has the movie Us, which is the latest Jordan Peele movie. There's 1917, Queen and Slim, and then the rest are their animated films from uh, DreamWorks and Illumination, like How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, Abominable and The Secret Life of Pets 2. But one major one, however, was actually Cats. But considering the result of it, how it's doing at the box office, and especially the reactions that came out of it ever since the people have first seen the trailers, they decided that it ain't worth the risk. Now, technically, there was already one nomination that Cats did get, and that's actually a Golden Globe nomination for the song Beautiful Ghosts. But if you do remember, I think a week or two ago, or yeah, two weeks ago, when the shortlist has been revealed, 
and uh, for the Oscars, by the way. Now, Cats was on the short list for best visual effects, but Beautiful Ghost did not make it to the short uh, to the short list for best original song. But it looks like either way, Universal ain't taking the risk, and they decided to completely pull it out for any future nominations. But if that wasn't bad enough, this week. Universal actually got even worse news, where apparently this article from Deadline states that they are going to lose at least $71 million from the Cats movie. And this is actually, uh, re this is actually regarding, like, this is through estimations based on, uh, the budget of the film and how much money was already spent in order to bring Cats to life, which includes a 90 to $95 million budget. Uh, th like, some people would say it's either or, but, um, this article says it's a $90 million budget, plus an extra $150 million that is spent on publicity and advertising. But because of how it's doing terribly at the box office, they could be losing at least $71 million. But the big thing to advertise here, the big, like if there are two words here to really emphasize the most, it is at least. Meaning that they would lose $71 million if things go well. This is the best case scenario. Uh, in this article, it even says that, uh, where is it? Um, ah, here it is. I'll just go and read uh, this little piece here. Our finance sources informed us over this week that the Universal Amblin's working title feature adaptation of the near $4 billion grossing Andrew Lloyd Webber stage musical is bound to lose at least $71 million. That is, if the pick reaches a global box office result of a hundred million dollars, meaning 40 million stateside and 60 million abroad. But right now, as I am recording this, oh, they are far from that. There is still a lot of, they, they still have a very long way uh, in order to reach that. In fact, if I go to box office mojo and just do a quick refresh, yeah, uh, okay, so it is, okay, so it still is that number. So if I do a quick refresh, so far, uh, right now, Cats has a domestic total of $23 million and a worldwide total of four, of uh, nearly $43.5 million. So at best, it could just lose $71 million. But at worst, it is possible that it could lose over $100 million. That is actually a legitimate strong possibility. So what the fridge happened? How is it that Cats went from this big, highly anticipated blockbuster to just this downright disaster, a box office bomb, and a, a movie that's trying to heavily campaign for the awards lost all of its chances to even be nominated at all, and the only people that will ever recognize Cats the most is just gonna be the Razzies. What the fridge happened? What led to the downfall of Cats here? Well, I think, obviously, I need to go and state the obvious. I need to go and start off with what many people would first say when asked why did Cats fail? Nobody wanted to see mutated cats for two freaking hours long. This movie is freaking hideous. It scares people. Like when you look at the trailers of it, it's unappealing the way that they're trying to make all these mutated cat people and stuff like that. It's just a very unappealing look. Like, yeah, I kind of get the direction that they want to try to do, you know, make a more high tech version of what we would see on stage. But still, 
even at that, like, at least on stage, we recognize that it's just makeup and costumes. Here, however, this looks like something out of freaking Dr. Moreau. And especially, like, the image that I see here on this Deadline article, that they're using the cat uh, that, is, uh, that is portrayed by Taylor Swift. And her character in the movie is meant to be the sexy one. The one that we were, that we're supposed to find very attractive and really hot. Which, honestly, I'm looking at this and it's like, no, nah, ain't touching that with a freaking 10-foot pole. It's just, there's nothing appealing to look at. And, like, especially with the fact that in the trailers, people have been extremely vocal that they don't want to watch this. They're already uncomfortable enough when watching the trailers of cats seeing all these, like, cat people just walking around and parading and dancing around with the, with their weird mutated tail that's attached to them they're already comfortable they're already uncomfortable with the trailers themselves i mean it, could they even withstand going through two hours of this no audiences have pretty much like they've been vocal in the past and now they are being vocal with their wallets saying that they don't want this they don't want this to actually happen so this was something that they have been warned many many times before but universal ignored their cries and on top of that i would like to mention that there is another movie that actually helped added fuel to make cats look bad. And I know that there are some people that would like to mention this. And you know there's going to be like a bunch of uh, people that will bring this up. And that is actually regarding Sonic the Hedgehog. Because around the same time, Sonic the Hedgehog released their trailer first. And the visuals are equally as terrible. It was just horrifying to look at this ugly, realistic Sonic the Hedgehog. However, in a very rare, nearly mythological instance, uh, Paramount decided to listen to the criticisms and the backlash from the public and decided to go and improve upon the designs of Sonic the Hedgehog. In a way, now, the new look of it has been highly praised, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Sonic the Hedgehog movie would end up becoming one of the biggest films of 2020. It could be possible. But because Sonic the Hedgehog did that, did what no other movie would legitimately go and do, it pretty much raises the question to Cats, well, if Sonic the Hedgehog did it, why wouldn't Cats do it? Right now, there is no excuse for the ugly visuals. Universal just kept on doubling down, saying that they love the visuals, they're proud of their achievements, and now they end up screwing themselves over. But there is also another reason, and this is just something that I recently realized about what led to the downfall of this Cats movie, and that is actually the original source material. If you really do think about it, a cat, like a live action Cats movie, like what they're trying to do, regardless if it's in costume or if they're doing like some CGI thing right over here, then it's hopeless. It's an entirely hopeless cause. Because let's think about the Cats fans. Let's think about the reasons why the musical has been so beloved for decades at this point. Why is it, like, what is it specifically that made Cat, what is it that made the musical work, but something that the movie can never go and achieve? Because I know that technically there are a few things that you can adapt onto the st you know you can adapt onto the film like you'll bring in the musics and you'll bring in the songs and you will bring in the uh the the sets as well like if they're not too reliant on uh the sets like i'll probably need to do a bit more research if you know more then feel free to comment on it but uh in terms of the backgrounds and the sets if they were if they're not too dependent on using CGI and actually use practical sets, then that is something they could adapt to the uh, to the to the film. But in terms of the stage play, what people love about that is stuff like the makeup, the costumes, the choreography, and the fact that everything is happening live in front of your uh, in front of your face. That what you see right in front of you 
is actually real. It is actually happening. It is not in front of a screen. You actually do see real people performing these choreographies and singing these songs. These are things that movies can never achieve to actually get. Maybe with the maybe with the makeup, maybe with the costumes, but this movie did not go and do so. And the grand majority of things that was highly beloved in the musical got lost in translation on the feature film. And another thing that did get lost in translation is regarding the characters. Because that's another thing that many Cats fans absolutely love about the musical. It's the variety of like quirky and strange characters that they would go and meet. Rather it be like Rum Tum Tugger, Bustopher Jones, Old Deuteronomy, uh, uh, McCavity, and all those cats. You know, they love to meet those characters. And when you would watch a stage production, there is a very high chance that you don't know who the actors are when they're performing their characters, thus making it easier to believe that who you are seeing are not actors, but the actual characters. That you are seeing Bustopher Jones or Gus the Theater Cat or the that weird railway cat thing. I don't know who's what what his name is or uh, Mr. Mistopheles or any of those characters. You believe that they are the characters because you don't know who these actors are. So your brain kind of says, okay, that's who they are. Those are the characters. They say they are the characters, so I believe they are the characters. This did not happen in the movie. The fact that they brought an all-star cast ended up screwing them over. Because when you watch the film, you don't really see the characters. You only see the actors being the actors. You just see Rebel Wilson, who is now fused with Garfield, just tumbling around making slapstick and pratfall humor. You see... James Corden just being his regular obnoxious cringy self. You see Taylor Swift being the seductress with a grudge against her ex, which in a way, if you think about the McCavity song, like that kind of is a Taylor Swift song in itself. So I, I do kind of get the casting, but you don't see the cat. You just see Taylor Swift being Taylor Swift. Even Ian McKellen. You like you don't really see Gus. You see an old actor and Ian McKellen is an old actor. So that's so a lot of what people love about the original Cats musical ended up getting so lost in translation onto the feature film. And that's what really screwed over this movie. Where not even the fans of the musical can appreciate the movie itself, it's already really unappealing, and oh, like even the things that people like about the musical cannot be adapted onto the film, thus really screwing this movie over, and that's why it ended up becoming a major box office disaster, where it could cost universal, like rather it be like 70 million or 100 million, like Universal is really paying the price on this film. But one thing I will say, that is much more tragic than what ended up happening as the final result of the film, and what's even more tragic than the amount of money that Universal lost on this, is actually the fact that it lost its chances at the awards. The fact that it got removed from the For Your Consideration list of Universal's movies. That is the most tragic thing that happened to Cats. And what I'm about to say, some people might laugh it off, some people might think that it is absolutely stupid what I'm going to say, but in a way, it is actually true when you really do think about it. The thing is, this Cats movie is an Oscar bait film. I know it's strange, but it's actually true. Like, the reason why Universal really wanted to build this is mainly because it wants to have this be like really profitable, not just when it's in theaters, but also in the long run. To have this be called like the Oscar nominated or the Oscar winning cats. I can totally imagine that there are several categories that it is trying to go and get in order to you know in order to be highly prominent in several awards like I, and i'm not just talking about best picture but also obviously they would want to really campaign beautiful ghost to be the next best original song because of the collaboration with taylor swift and andrew lloyd webber uh there is also um what else 
like best actress i wouldn't be surprised if they wanted to make uh, jennifer hudson be like the next anne hathaway like you know how anne ha you know how anne hathaway won the oscar for uh for les miserables they like I i'm pretty sure they would want to do the same thing for jennifer hudson to win an oscar because she sang memory very well uh the, like I, I can imagine like best art direction they were trying to go for best visual effects you know you know and all that stuff like, they're trying to do all that. They want to go and try to really campaign this to be a major Oscar contender. But it ended up failing. And you gotta keep in mind, it is actually extremely, extremely rare for a movie to be taken out of a list of for your consideration. Because usually with studios, they don't care how good or bad the movie would be. They would try to go and push it to get nominations and awards as much as possible. Like, I remember on Twitter, they put out a great example of this, where uh, Paramount heavily tried to promote uh, tra the fifth Transformers film to have it be nominated as many awards as possible. And even at that, a lot of people looked at that and said, like, th th like, it's almost like it's a joke because a lot of people do say that the fifth Transformers film is probably the worst of all of Michael Bay's Transformers movies. So it's the same. So in the case here, it's actually really tragic where, like, I am kind of debating if it's, like, no longer funny the fact that, like, Katz is taken away of its main mission, its big goal, in order to have a good long life that it would be recognized. And at the most now, it can only say that it got one Golden Globe nomination, and that's pretty much it. It's a sad, you know, it's a sad tale, but honestly, with what happened to Katz, like, Universal has no one to blame but themselves for it. Like, they really, they, they they only have themselves to blame. It, it really is just, like, it looks terrible, the execution is terrible, audiences absolutely hate it, the public hates it, and it, it's losing money, and they got, and honestly, it's a hopeless mission. That's the big thing about Cats, it's the fact that all this is a hopeless mission from the very beginning. The moment they said, let's make a Cats movie, that's where it ended up becoming a major disaster. So with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall. And it's time that I want to ask you guys, how do you feel about the bomb of cats? How cats ended up becoming a major dis disaster. Have you guys seen the film? If so, let me know what you think of it. Um, do, you think, do you think it's justified? Do you think it's absolutely tragic? Let me know. Let me know what you all think. Whoa, excuse me. There we go. <sighs> Let's see now. Uh, I read that Steven Spielberg wanted to produce an animated adaptation of the musical. It could have been better than this film. Hey, it might have, e it might have even been better than the 1999 animated version of The King and I. It is highly possible, and I can imagine an animated film would definitely solve the problem of the visuals. It would have been a nice-looking film, but... Uh, still, though, there is the aspect of cats, and oh, and there is one more thing I forgot to mention, and probably the biggest thing, and that's regarding the biggest criticism against the Cats musical in general, is the fact that there's no freaking story! Cats has no story at all! Like, the most that you could find is that, the, like, these group of cats called the Jellicle Cats, they're trying to find this one cat that they want to send to the heavy side lair in order for them to have a new life. And that's pretty much it. There's barely much of a story, and that's often the biggest criticism with the musical. And that's a criticism that would absolutely not fly in a movie. So how the fridge can you adapt that? Alright, let's see now. I probably shouldn't say this, but it's saying something when the Emoji movie is more successful than the Cats movie. Yes, that movie was bad and they didn't put a lot of effort into it, but I could see quite a number of little kids enjoying the Emoji movie because of its bright colors and their love of phones and, and uh, mobile games. The Cats movie perhaps would scare a lot of kids, even if they put as much care and detail as much as possible. 
Uh, also, that, well, there is that, but the main reason why the Emoji Movie actually did end up becoming successful, it's mainly because it's a cheap movie as well. Like, it looks cheap, but at the same time, but that is mainly because it is cheap. It's an animated film that only costs $50 million. This one, however, costs almost twice as much. So budget does actually play a major factor in a movie's success or a failure. I can guarantee you if the Emoji Movie had the same amount, if the Emoji Movie had the same budget as Cats, then it wouldn't have been profitable at all. It would have also been a major box office bomb as well. But yeah, I thought I would uh, clarify that in terms of how that ended up as a bomb. Uh, let's see. Sometimes I wonder why Universal bothered to make this movie. And as for Sonic, at least Paramount did their best with fixing Sonic's design. And yet Universal is on its side like, eh, who cares? The visuals are fine and stop your whining. Universal, some advice. I'm not saying listen to fans a a all the time, but listen because at one point they might criticize something important. If you don't listen or understand, it will be too late and change your mistakes. That's the best advice I could give. Oh, and there is something that I almost did forget is that there was, like, after the movie's release, they did actually update the designs. They did try to go and put an update on the visuals to go and, uh, quote unquote, improve it. But th honestly, they barely did much. And you know it's bad when they had to do so. After its freaking opening weekend, after it made its first impression to audiences, that is, th th honestly, trying to make improvements on that, like, the fact that you literally have to make a patch to a freaking movie, that's a clear bad sign, th that's a really bad sign, you should have done this literally months ago when the trailers were released, you shouldn't have done, like, honestly, like they're, they're trying like I can understand that they were trying to fix the problem, but they ended up just making things worse <laughs> Okay, let's see now what's even crazier about this is that the movie had to get an updated version Yeah, exactly what I'm talking about had to get an updated version to fix some of the CGI I think this is the first time that the movie had to be fixed after its release Which is basically the equivalent of a video game getting a patch to fix the bugs exactly that that was exactly what I was talking about there Okay Let's see. I knew Cats would receive bad reviews and a total and was a total box office bomb. This is like 2018's December release Mortal Engines produced by Peter Jackson all over again, where Universal repeated the same mistakes except Cats is a lot worse than Mortal Engines due to the unbearable visual effects. I don't know why uh, Universal believes this will be a an awards contender because it is not. Tom Hooper may be, but it should not be made in the first place since its play doesn't uh, d uh, tr transcend well onto a feature film. And honestly, I think I can understand because, like, the thing is, they really wanted to make Cats their next Miserable. To make it a big budget musical spectacle based on one of the biggest Broadway shows ever. And literally have it be directed by Tom Hooper who also did direct Les Miserables. So they were really trying to go and be like Les Mis, not just like in terms of marketing and stuff and the way they built the movie, but also to be like a major awards contender. Like they really want this to be the next big movie musical, but obviously it kind of fell flat on its face. All right, uh, let's see now. I'll go read one more before we jump on to the next one. Uh... Gotta, gotta take more than a new jellical life to make this, uh, to make right this wrong. Uh, it's not surprising that cats would have to pull their nominations. The $71 million loss is a bit much, but even that's kind of expected considering it came out at the same time as Star Wars and Jumanji. However, going back to the four-year consideration poll, I saw one tweet calling Universal cowards, but since this is, uh, cats we're talking about, does that technically make them pussies instead? That could be, but that depends on uh, how your taste in puns is. Okay, well, sorry to cut this a little bit short, but now it is time that we are going to go into the grand finale this time. And uh, for this one in particular, this will be something that is uh, a bit interesting to discuss because once again, we are going to be discussing about internet outrage and people angry at Disney. 
Except this time, it's not necessarily related to Star Wars or any franchises or anything related to their movies and stuff. But this time, we are going to go and look into Disney+. Plus. And apparently, fans have been massively upset of the fact that Disney Plus has been quietly taking away some content. Uh, the fact that we are in a new year right now means that pretty soon we are going to get some new content. But right when January 1st, 2020 came in, Disney suddenly decided to remove uh, a lot of their movies without people knowing, or at least some of their movies. Uh, in this article from Polygon, it did state that there are a few significant films, including Doctor Doolittle, The Sandlot, Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, uh, on Stranger Tides, and both Home Alone one and two have been removed. And the biggest one that uh, people have been upset of the removals of the uh, of uh, Disney Plus is actually Home Alone and Home Alone two. People freaked out about it, and there was a little bit of a backlash. Uh, that came from that. And from there, a lot of people have been wondering and concerned about what does this actually mean for Disney+. Plus? Because there have been a few articles, including this one from Polygon, uh, that does explain about the confusion of what Disney meant as to what movies would have a new home in terms of uh, streaming services. Because part of its marketing often states that there are some movies and uh, there are plenty of movies that they have in mind that they want to make Disney Plus the permanent streaming service home. That there are some movies that they say it will stay there forever and once it's on Disney Plus, it will be on Disney Plus uh, for the rest of time and they have mentioned like many of their animated classics and we're talking about like Snow White, Fantasia, Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Little Mermaid, Frozen and all those films like those ones would stay on Disney Plus forever but they didn't specify that not all their movies would be uh, uh would, would have a permanent home on Disney Plus and there will be some that will come and go. And technically, uh, it is not necessarily their first time that they did so. Uh, even in this article, they did mention that uh, they did, uh, like, uh, earlier in uh, Disney Plus time, like, uh, when it was, like, fresh and new, uh, they did remove movies like uh, The Shaggy Dog and Garfield 2, A Tale of Two Kitties. But still, it is something that a lot of people question about, uh, what to expect from Disney Plus and which ones should stay and which ones would go. And from there, uh, this was a bit of news that did get me a little bit curious as to what was going on. Because when I first heard about this news, it was from the backlash and the outrage of the fact that uh, Home Alone 1 and 2 were completely removed from Disney+. Plus. And considering this time of year, considering that I heard this after New Year's and stuff... At first, I was thinking that maybe Disney did so because the holidays are over. Because technically, with the Home Alone movies, they would technically count as Christmas movies. So, because they are Christmas movies, and the holidays are pretty much over right now, then there's no need to have them. So, maybe... Like, there are some films that they want to they wanna keep seasonally. You know, they just want to keep, uh, like, during the holiday time, and then afterwards they would get rid of them. But, that is actually not the case. Uh, I went, uh, like, following afterwards, I decided to do a little research myself, and went on my account on Disney Plus to double-check to see, like, which movies are there and which movies are not. And there was one in particular that I wanted to test to see if my theory would be correct if they removed it for holiday reasons. And I was immediately proven wrong when I saw that one movie that I wanted to find and I easily found it was actually Noel, which if you guys don't know, is Disney Plus's original Christmas movie. That somehow is still on Disney Plus. So you removed Home Alone 1 and 2, but you still kept Noel onto your streaming service. That's when I got a little bit suspicious. And I did try to think about it. That's when I when I start to think, okay, why is it that there's this backlash? Why are people so upset about it? And that's when I realized. 
it is not necessarily the fact of the movies themselves that were removed. Because, okay, I can understand a little bit of, like, uh, the Home Alone movies and, like, the Sandlots. Uh, I heard it's a little bit of a cult classic as well. Like, it's not just those movies uh, in particular that made people upset. It's more the fact that Disney right now, they are adding and removing movies without mentioning everything. It's the fact that they were quietly taking these movies away is what made people upset. Because I will say this, when it comes to the other streaming services like Hulu or Netflix or whatever, they would pretty much do the same thing like Disney Plus, that they would add new content and they would take away new content. Like this is a cycle that everyone is used to on streaming services. But the big difference is that with services like Netflix, they would tell you in advance which ones they're adding and which ones they're removing. Like, they would go and put out a newsletter or put out a message to their subscribers and say, hey, listen, we're taking these things away in like a few days or a few weeks or whatever. So if you want to go and stream them, if you want to watch them, if you want to watch them on Netflix, now is the time to do so because you might lose your chance for at least a while. So that's the one thing that they just want to go and emphasize. That's why, uh, you know, it's the transparency that people really do appreciate. And at that point, uh, people wouldn't have any complaints at all. Like, th at, that, at that point, they would be perfectly fine with whatever they would want to add and what they would want to remove. At least they're being transparent, and at least people are in the know of what's going on. Here, however, it was a little bit of a shock that there are some people that still would want to watch something like Home Alone, uh, even after the holidays and stuff. But then suddenly when they log on to Disney Plus, they realize oh, it's gone. Where did it go? Oh my God, it's missing. So the thing is, is that with streaming services, people do not like surprises. They really don't. Like when they would go and uh, check out something on a streaming service, they would like to know what is in there and what is not in there. And whenever there is some changes, they want to know what these changes are and they want to know in advance so that they can prepare themselves. This is not a place where you can make any form of surprises. Now, I know technically, like, technically in a way, this is still a new thing. Like, Disney Plus, as I'm recording this, is only a few months, is only about a couple of months old, or not even, it's about like a month and a half old now. And from there, with Disney Plus, like, sure, uh, they did reveal recently that, uh, like, in tw like, they revealed their lineup of what's going to be added in 2020. Like, they mentioned that coming soon we would have Muppets Now, and Season 2 of The Mandalorian, and, uh, and WandaVision, and all different shows and original movies and stuff like that. You know, they, they would go and make a big reveal to tell you what's going to be coming up. But Disney still, but in this case, I really do feel like Disney uh, has a lot to learn in terms of uh, transparency, in terms of streaming services, that if they are going to be doing some significant changes where they are, they are either going to add something or remove something, they need to let people know because... This is not a thing that people like surprises. They love what people love is transparency and to be on the know of what's going to be happening and what's going to be taken out. This, this is something that people want to know in advance in turn because for, for a lot of people like they don't like honestly a, a lot of people like for some this is all they got like technically they wouldn't have satellite or cable or television like they only got streaming services and like, this is the only things that they would have. So really, like, essentially, this is like their library of films. And if there's someone messing with their library of films, then of course, they would get massively upset. But overall, um, there is one message that really does highlight from this. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about Disney or Disney+. Plus, But this is regarding all streaming services in general. And uh, the moral of the story for this one, children, is that physical media is always better. Is that at least, because the thing is with physical media, no matter what it is, as long as you buy it and as long as you own it, 
you know it's always there. Because the people who do have DVDs and Blu-rays and whatever of stuff uh, like Home Alone and Home Alone 2, they're not all that worried about uh, their content being missing on Disney+. Plus Because they know they have it. They, they can still watch it whenever or whatever they want. Even with me right now. I could go and say, you know what? I'm in the mood for the Peanuts movie. Is it on Netflix? Is it on Disney Plus? Is it any? Is it in any streaming service? No. Oh well. Hey. Well, good thing that I do have it on DVD and Blu-ray, so I can watch it whenever I want because I know that I own it. You know, honestly. Well, actually. I don't know if uh, the Peanuts movie is in any streaming service. I, I was just using that as a, as an example. But y y you know the funny thing is, is that just thinking about it now, uh, like it, it, it does make me realize that, you know what I would love to see? Like I, I would actually, like in instances like these, I would love to see a meme be made out of it. Like you remember that old meme that gamers would use like the PC master race to say that PC gaming is always superior than console gaming. I would love to see that, but with like physical media, like, you know, like we would have the Blu-ray master race. It is uh, like the, like having physical copies of movies is always superior than having them just on streaming services. Oh, your favorite movie has been... Oh, your favorite movie, like, Home Alone, has been taken out of Disney Plus? Well, then, the Blu-ray Master Race has prevailed once again! <laughs> yeah, but, you know, honestly, this it's, it's things like this that does make me proud to be a Blu-ray and DVD collector, or a collector of physical media. Like, honestly, I'm proud of the collection that I have and that it is continuously growing. That I don't have to necessarily worry about uh, streaming services removing or uh, putting on things on, uh, on their streaming services. Like, I still have Disney+, Plus and I still have Netflix, and I am still using them, yes. But, none of them can ever beat the sensation of having a movie whenever you want it. So I don't care. Like, I could be what Like, honestly, while people are waiting for HBO Max to watch their Studio Ghibli films, I got my entire collection over here so I can watch them whenever I want. And I don't even have to pay for HBO Max to watch all these movies. I got, I got them. So, hey, you know what? At least I got my physical media. But anyways, let's go into the chat wall right over here. And I would like to ask... What do you all think of this little controversy of Disney's lack of transparency regarding removing their films? Do you understand the controversy that's going on? Uh, do you, and also, which one do you prefer? Streaming services or physical copies? That, that could be a good question to ask. Hold on, I just need to put, uh, yeah, I just need to put this back here. Let me know what you all think. All right, let me hear it, guys. Uh, let's see. Uh, I hate Disney's policy of locking things away in the vault since it's anti-customer. I love going to, uh, re repertory screenings of classic Disney movies, but Disney rarely allows that to happen since they want a larger share of the tickets. And now they're doing this policy with all the Fox movies except for Rocky Horror. Goodbye to screenings of Die Hard, Alien, and many more. Out of everything, uh, from the mer merger with Fox, this is what pisses me off the most. Uh, they're the only studio that does it, and I want them to, and the comment stops from there. Again, again, the Blu-ray Master Race prevails. <laughs> oh, you, oh, your, fo oh, your favorite Fox movies like Die Hard ain't getting other screenings and stuff like that? Well, good thing that you got it on Blu-ray and DVD, right? If you don't, then you better do so. Okay, let's see. Disney Plus is starting to become like Netflix now. They too uh, have removed TV shows and movies right, right and left. For example, 2017, I was able to watch Alpha and Omega. Ouch. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, sometimes later, I w it was gone. Uh, it is because the movie license was expired. When Matilda was removed off of Netflix, I wanted to keep watching the movie over and over again. So I bought it via YouTube Movie. And yeah, and I mean, there are ways that you can also go and buy it uh, digitally as well you can go and uh, do that that is also another option uh let's see now the removal of movies on disney plus is questionable especially when i think they mentioned that they wouldn't remove move content a few months ago 
Talk about being hypocritical if you think about it. Exactly. And that uh, that's also another thing that really did fuel the controversy is that people don't necessarily know what Disney is talking about in terms of if they are going to be keeping content or removing content. So there is also, like, because of this action, it's not just the lack of transparency, but it's also the confusion of what Disney meant in the past. So that's the big thing to, to mention on that. Uh, let's see now. Uh, I'm still excited for a 101 Dalmatian stream when it comes out on Disney Plus, but Disney Plus needs to be more careful with his streaming service. Exactly. Um, uh, who else can we have? Keep in mind that Disney Plus has not released most of their shows on DVD, so if they ever remove them from Disney Plus, it will be bad for the fans of those shows. Uh, for example, The New Adventures of Winnie the Pooh only has some... Uh, hold on a sec. Where did it go? Oh, uh, yeah. Only has some episodes on DVD, and Teacher's Pet does not have any episodes on DVD, uh, on DVD aside from the first episode. Eh, you, you do have a bit of a point there. That That is possible. Uh, let's see. Streaming services should be like Jell-O. Always there's always room for more. Even my DVD collection can't be like that as uh, even my DVD collection can be like that as well. Uh, let's see what else. Um, I'll read. Uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna read one more comment and then we'll go from there. I have a few guesses why some films are disappearing on Disney Plus. One is perhaps a glitch since the streaming service is still on its infancy and they still need to work on a few bugs and mechanics. Uh, honestly, no, that wouldn't be the case because at this point, Disney would put out a bit of a message that, uh, there is some technical issues. They would have addressed that, uh, if that was the case. Second is perhaps that they have a bit of a spacing issue, so they need to make some room for more content because they, they can upgrade their spaces. That could actually be highly possible because that is most cases with streaming services. Uh, the last guess is perhaps the budget to keep each film on the service as long as they can. No licensing issue, just budgeting. Uh, I think honestly, out of all your, uh, honestly, out of all your guesses there, I would say number two seems like the most plausible. And with all that said, that should conclude this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. And so far, we are off on a very interesting and fun-filled start. And hopefully, this will go and continue for the rest of 2020. So, I would like to say Happy New Year to you all. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. And until next time, see you later, dudes. Thank you.